Colonel Chuck Jones, I'm a retired colonel. Uh, my connections to the museum, of which I just got a brand new bench right outside the front door. I was a base commander at Blyville, Arkansas, where the B-52 came from. I got time in this airplane and lost the flip of a coin to bring it to the museum. We went on alert. After the B-58s went to Southeast Asia in the 130s, to the CCK, where the 130 in the next hangar came out of my squadron, the 776th Tactical Airlift Squadron. I got time at it in Vietnam. When I came back from Vietnam, I went to Albuquerque in RB-57F High Altitude Reconnaissance. And this airplane is just not just a navigator, you're a navigator bombardier. So all the mission planning, all this target study, and just getting the airplane from point A to point B. Everything has time, time into entry, time over target. You're busy from takeoff to landing. It was one of the first inertial navigation systems, but unlike the inertial navigation systems of today, it relied on Doppler, it relied on an astral tracker. Coming back from Spain, the speed of the airplane was such that the astral tracker across the Atlantic stayed locked on the sun at 56 degrees all the way across the Atlantic until we decelerated to hit a tanker around New York City. It was an amazing airplane. I used to walk on, on alert. I'd go out and watch them in the pattern and just marvel that I was able to be in that thing. It was a hand-picked, selectively manned unit. All the process you had to go through, the selection process. We pulled alert, it seemed like, constantly. I was on alert for Martin Luther King when he was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy, when they went around the moon on Christmas Eve, when they landed on the moon in July. At Little Rock and uh, at that time Bunker Hill, now Grissom, we had 20 airplanes on alert. Free World's first supersonic, twice the speed of sound bomber. It set 19 speed records. It uh, was awarded five aviation trophies. And if you look at the patch, you'll see the five aviation trophies. This particular airplane uh, was a, won the Bendix Trophy. The last, in uh, October 1962, it was the last Bendix Trophy awarded. Jimmy Doolittle got the first one in 1928. But as the jet engine evolved, more airplanes won the Bendix Trophy, and so this one was actually the last one awarded, and then Bendix stopped the trophy. That's why the SR-71 doesn't have a Bendix Trophy. When the airplane was designed, it was after World War II, uh, Korea, we were, it was still high altitude bombing, and so the idea was to go in fast, drop your bomb, and, and leave. And so there, because of the design of the airplane, there is no bomb bay, and that's why the pod is there. There's two pods. The big pod that you see is fuel, about 24,000 pounds. And then the upper pod, if you look back there, you'll see some fins on it. About halfway in there is where the warhead is stored. And every day on alert, you had to go out there, pop the door, and you look in there, check your ready safe switch to make sure it's still in a safe position. So when you drop your weapon, that whole upper pod is like a big dart going to the weapon. But now when Gary Powers got shot down, that changed things. And by the end of 1962, they had made two pylons on each side. And at Little Rock, we had Mark 43s. They were 70 kiloton to 1.1 megaton. And the bomb was a nine megaton warhead that was in that pod. The same as a Mark 40, 53, that big silver one down there. And so now we're low level. Now we have five targets instead of just one. But you know, in this big supersonic futuristic airplane back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, it was only active duty from 59 to 69, in the cockpit, in case we lost radio communication, there's a, there's a string that runs through all three cockpits with a little bag, and so you pass notes. Usually it was, hey, I got a roast beef sandwich. Anybody want to trade for a piece of chicken? These four hangars are so full of history. It takes a long time to go through here and really absorb all the history that is made here. And like I tell people, we, the airplanes in here, they either set a speed record, they set a, some kind of an altitude record. They did something special. Uh, we're on a special recovery mission. Uh, we're all shot up. Everything in here has a reason. The reason we have it was because it was special and that's why the museum has so many airplanes that have a story to tell. It takes a long time to go through and read all the stories. So I try to, when I'm walking around and I see somebody looking at an airplane, I'll say, hey, you know, this is what the airplane did, how it did it, why it did it, and where it did it.